So, esteemed panelists, would you please introduce yourselves to us? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jess. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I actually just finished my PhD in Romance Languages, and that took me six years. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Donia. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm uh, now uh, becoming a 30-year PhD student um, at Michigan at the Biomedical Engineering Program. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan, and my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm in the MD PhD program here at the University of Michigan. Um, I've been here since 2018, but I'm in approximately my second or third year of a bioinformatics PhD. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, y'all. So to get us started, what do you wish that you knew in your first year here at Michigan? Yeah, so I think um, there's a lot of different areas of graduate school so in terms of academics being in the humanities I wish I'd known more about the content and style and argumentation style that was expected in papers because like I'm from the UK I did my undergrad there and that was different in Michigan but it was also difficult for me because I didn't have anyone I could sort of ask in my family or like friends from home who were doing the same thing so I wish I'd sort of known that what was expected in seminars especially in terms of participation I also wish I'd known how to make the most of the academic opportunities in graduate school, like how to navigate conferences, serving on committees and like networking and meeting other people. And this third thing that I wish I'd known is how to find mentors and role models that were a good fit for me, because there's like faculty and instructors all around you, but not everyone will relate to all of the concerns you have. So it can be really helpful to find people who are like have been in a similar position and can like support you in those ways. Um, I could go next. Um, a couple things I wish I knew my first year is, uh, first of all, like, basically you are doing a PhD because you're learning, like you want to become an expert in the field, like you're not expected to know everything. Um, and so it's like very uncomfortable, but very normal to say that you don't know something. Um, I think I struggled a lot my first semester specifically during like lab rotations because I felt like I needed to do as much as I could um, instead of like focusing more on like lab culture and like seeing if I like the mentor fit um, and feeling constantly like I was just not performing as well as, as I could have uh, because I didn't know enough. Um, but that is the whole point. You're not supposed to know everything and that's okay. Um, and I still don't know everything and that's still okay. Um, so maybe just take it easy and be like kinder to yourself. Um, and the second thing maybe I would put out there is like, if you feel like you're struggling with the transition, because I feel like the shift from like either industry to going back to school or like from undergrad straight to grad school could be challenging. So if you are open to considering like maybe a therapist or counseling, like especially the first couple of months, I wish I would have done that. Um, I felt very isolated at the beginning, then realized like if you had a good support system, that's all you really like. It helps. It's I felt like it was all I really needed to like kind of get through the first year. Um, and I wish I had like discovered that sooner, which sounds like really common sense. But, you know, it's hard to think about everything when you're like trying to get your feet on the ground. Yeah, I think I would definitely echo that. But the support system is really important um, in grad school. Uh, I think that going in, you don't necessarily know like kind of how mentally challenging it can be at times too. Um, I would say outside of that, I think things that are really important that I wish I'd known are, I wish that I had a better concept of what to look for in a mentor. Um, so I think initially, like I came in thinking that the topic that they research is really like <clears throat> the only thing that I should care about. And I think that that's the farthest thing from the truth possible. Um, you're going to spend a lot of years if ever you decide to be your mentor. So I think the most important thing is that you can work super well with them. And that was something that I think was a little counterintuitive to me to start. Um, the only other thing that I would really emphasize is that grad school has lots of different benchmarks and things that you will feel very pressured to do. And I think it's very important to keep a perspective about what really matters. For you. What are the main things you want to take away when you're done with your PhD program? In science PhDs, that's typically like things like publications. Um, so maybe you should spend a little less time sweating about, or a little less time sweating things like committee meetings or prelim exams. Um, those are just kind of just like steps to get you to publication. 
Thanks, y'all. Okay, so we just talked about what you wish you knew in your first year. Now, could you um, tell us what you wish you had done in your first year? I know y'all shared a little bit, but could you elaborate a bit more? Yeah, so I think um, a big thing for me is that I wish I'd been more organized in terms of tracking opportunities because you can't do everything all at once so I wish that when I'd heard about conferences I'd heard about programs on campus for professional development I wish I'd sort of kept a note of when these were and like when there were deadlines so I would like remember to do them like you can't do everything in one year but sort of having more of a plan for my time as opposed to sort of spending my first year not doing anything because it, it's fine to take time to settle in but I wish I'd sort of kept better track of what I wanted to do and sort of not ended up doing so much in my later years and spread it out a bit more and I actually also wish so from my second year onwards I was in a residential scholarship program where we did a lot of community service and I actually wish I'd started doing community service like independently in my first year as well because I think it's a really good way to connect with people outside your department and to settle into Ann Arbor and I wish I'd done that sooner because I think it would have given me more of a balance between just spending all my time on academics and work versus you know getting to know the city more and having an extra layer of structure I think that would have really helped me. Yeah, I um, I second the exploring like clubs and like kind of building a community there. Uh, again, just like wishing I like focus more on developing like a good support system my first semester um, instead of like trying too hard in labs um, and sleep. I wish I slept more. <laughs> um, yeah, I think for me it would definitely be uh, just focus on really finding uh, a good mentor. I think if you can finish your first year in a PhD program and find someone that you like working with and communicate well with, I think you're ahead of schedule. Yeah, that definitely resonates. Okay, y'all. So, what are the best things that helped you when you first got here? Uh, so, I didn't necessarily plan all of these things so one thing that really helped me was I ended up applying to housing really late because like my visa appointment was late and I was like oh I don't really want to commit to something until I can do that but I actually ended up renting a room in the home of a retired couple and that was really great because it was a little bit further away from campus and I sort of had a balance where I was living with people who were nothing to do with the university like they had they were heavily involved in their church so I'd meet a lot of people who would come around for dinner and they yeah I would come home every night and they'd be watching random things on tv and just baking and stuff so I think finding a living situation that was so far removed from what I was doing on campus really helped like keep me grounded in some ways and yeah just you know doing small things to like give myself some balance so I had like an on-campus job for 10 hours a week and I spent a lot of time working out like um how the stipend and the taxes would work like as soon as I got there because I'm like okay I sort of understand what's going to happen with that how much I should be getting and I'd recommend doing that you know like looking through the university's web pages because all the information is there but if you don't understand it you can just email the various offices and people like can help and it's just good to sort of have an understanding of those administrative things because it kind of takes like the pressure off you academically and in other areas so yeah Yeah, um, maybe this is also something I did like before I got here, but um, we have like a department student council uh, where like they're older students that try to organize um, like events. Um, and I reached out to them about housing um, and they helped like facilitate a group chat almost of all the first years um, and also give us tips on um, like restaurants and things to do in Ann Arbor, things like that. So um, I uh, highly recommend like reaching out to other students in your department if you have access to any emails. Um, it helps you understand like what the housing market is here before you get here because it is not great um, because it's like a college town. So a lot of things get um, like rented out pretty early on. Um, but it's also just like a nice way of like learning more about the city and making friends early on. Um, so that's one thing I, uh, I'm glad I did my first year. <laughs> um, I think probably the biggest thing that you can do or that helps me um, would be to establish a community or establish like a support system. Um, so this could be your fellow, you know, grad students. Um, I kind of like trying to find from, like friends in areas that you don't like find people to be friends with that you are not in grad school with. Um, so I think it definitely helps balance you a little bit. Um, and get a pet. 
you don't have one. Okay, thanks, y'all. Um, okay, everyone, we're going to move to our Q and A, um, so that we can give y'all as much time to ask our panelists uh, specific questions that you have. As we transition into the Q and A, my colleague is going to place our evaluation survey in the chat, and uh, if you could just do me a favor and just open the link now, so that you'll have the tab ready and waiting for you when we're done. So remember that um, we're going to move through the Q&A um, by keeping stack. And for those who weren't here, when we first explained what stack is, it's just that we're gonna go down the line of questions in order of appearance. And so you can get on stack by raising your hand at the bottom of your Zoom screen or writing stack in the chat. And I'll call on you for either of those, or you can write your question in the chat and I will ask it for you. Um, please remember to speak slowly so that the closed captioning can capture all that you have to say. Um, okay, let's get started. And while y'all wait, I have a question for our panelists. What was the, what, or what are some things maybe that's really surprised you or that you didn't expect when you first got here? Um, this is like quite a personal thing, but I'm happy to share it. I think before I went to Michigan, I wouldn't say I had like low expectations of myself, but I didn't really understand like how to build a career or like what was out there or how to do that. And then when I got to Michigan, I was in quite a lot of spaces, like for example, some of the professional development programs in Rackham where like there was really clear advice and really clear guidance and I got to do a lot of things that really built my confidence in that area. So I actually, it, it wasn't that I didn't expect to feel good about stuff like that, but I did feel really good. And it kind of gave me like a new sense of actually, like I can build a professional career in something and I can sort of do more than I thought I did. So I like, I didn't expect that I would like enjoy a lot of those programs and stuff just because they were things that were unfamiliar to me because I'd not really been in an institution that offered stuff like that before. So I think, yeah, I think kind of going along to things and like being open to them and that because yeah I just didn't imagine that I would be pursuing the career I would be pursuing now at like the kind of places I'm applying to so yeah that was something that surprised me but that was like a really good surprise um something that surprised me was how my priorities shifted a little bit um my first year as um, as Ryan like had talked about, I was super focused also on like the research and like the field that I wanted because I thought that this is like what I wanted to do work in after I graduated. Um, and there's this one specific guy that I was like, I am coming to Michigan to to work with him. And then I rotated in his lab in a month for a month, and I just didn't feel like I clicked with his students. Um, I didn't click with him. He was really nice, but just something fell off um I was just like constantly stressed in his lab and then when I rotated in my now PI's lab I like just it was just a gut feeling I don't know how to explain it but like I I cared more about the people and like how I felt more than like the actual science um and I'm really glad that I decided to think that way um later in the semester because at the end of the day you're spending like five years with the same people and you don't want to like rip your hair out every time you see them. Um, so yeah, I a PhD is already so much work, like you don't wanna make it even like harder on yourself. So that's something that surprised me. I think my answer is actually very similar to yours, but um, I think the thing that surprised me the most is how much I have changed as a person since I came here. Um, just like I think you kind of will over the course of a, a long PhD program, you come in with all of these like expectations for yourself and what you're gonna do. And I don't know, just the things that you think are important to change with time. Um, so wouldn't, wouldn't have expected that necessarily. Yeah, that definitely resonates with um, everything that y'all have said. You and um, to go off a bit of what you've just mentioned, Donia, and then also what uh, you and Ryan have spoken about earlier about like mentor fit. How do you determine that 
I, when I came in, I thought like, this person does what I want to do. Therefore, <laughs> this person should be my mentor. Um, my advisor now um, is not in, in, in any way the area of what I want to study. And it, we have a fantastic relationship. She's the perfect advisor for me. Um, and yet we don't match like research topic wise at all. So if y'all could speak to like, what does it look like to understand like what, how do you find like the right mentor? So I I think you can have multiple mentors. Like I don't think you can necessarily get all the support you need from one person or one place. So um, like academically, so um, in the humanities, like you're not in a lab, so you, you're kind of working with one person and like you have a committee, but at least in my case, I did most of my work with my main advisor. And like he was, I decided I didn't want a career in academia. And he was like really upfront that he couldn't necessarily like direct me to the right places for that. but. I said to him like that was fine and I just sort of wanted him to take an interest which like he did so that was really great so then I actually so I got what I needed from him academically like his interests were aligned with mine and that was really good so I actually found my best mentors so I did the Rackham internship program which I would really recommend if people get an opportunity to do that and I actually found my best mentors at the place where I did my internship which was somewhere else on campus and it kind of actually we did a project about graduate mentoring in my internship so it's like quite funny that that they became really great mentors for me but I sort of did it by we would have like moments where we sort of connected as people as well as for work conversations and um I would like bring up topics and like that were important to me and like we had conversations about that and then it kind of grew from there and then I would sort of come with more structured questions like about job applications or about like navigating accommodations in the workplace just things like that and yes yeah, so I think you can build mentoring relationships in multiple places and sometimes actually naturally meeting as many different people as you can on campus um seeing who you click with and then sort of saying oh can we start up something more structured if that works for you where you bring specific questions can be a great way of going about it and also sometimes you can get really good support from peers as well in that way and you can offer peers your advice on various things too so there's like definitely lots of different places where you can get it from yeah I totally agree with that um I think what I focused on with looking for a mentor is, okay, so uh, <laughs> I'll backtrack. So like I mentioned, I, I was like really focused on the science um, and something that I just noticed with like the mentors that I didn't like was that our conversations were very like work focused, like this is my data, this is my progress for the week, that's it. And then they're like, all right, and like have nothing else to talk to me about. Um, something that I was, I like, I ramble, I talk, I like to have conversations with people. So like what I really like about my current PI is that uh, she's very personable. She um, likes to ask me about my day. Like if I'm away for like a week, sometimes we talk about that. Um, she's open to having these types of conversations. Um, and what was really important for me was um, that I have like a female PI, like a woman um, on my committee. Uh, because it's like my field is already like pretty male dominated um, and I wanted someone who like could understand my perspective as like a minority in the field um, and I'm glad that I was able to find that in the, uh, my mentor um, and just someone who like sees you as more than just like a data <laughs> collecting machine you know like someone who like actually genuinely wants to talk to you and know you um, these rotations that I did were as much of a test for me as it was for them because I like asked them about their communication style, their expectations of me. It's like really uncomfortable questions to ask, but the earlier on you can ask them, the better. Like if, if it like gives you like this weird feeling when they tell you like what their expectations are from the get go, I think that's already like a good sign that might not be the best fit. So just a lot of speed dating for the first few months of school. <laughs> I think speed dating is a really good way to think about it. And I think the first thing you need to know before you go speed dating is you have to be aware of what you are looking for. Um, so like, are you the type of person that wants to meet every week for an hour? Are you the type of person that likes to be left alone and maybe you catch up on the big things? You need to figure out what you want from your potential mentor, first of all. And once you know what you want, then I think you can cast a really broad net and start this speed dating process. You know, I think it's very okay to ask very focused, targeted questions. Like it, it may seem very like 
very forward to ask these things, but it's better to know straight up. Like if you guys had just have different ways of communication, if they're not cool with meeting once a week and they say this right away, like that's, I think, a clear sign that maybe they're not the best for you if that's what you want. Um, so I, I would say don't be afraid to necessarily interview people or meet with people briefly that maybe you wouldn't think you'd be interested in, but you need to click with. Um, because I think that that's how you can kind of end up with a better personal fit, which is much more important than research fit. Thanks, y'all. I know that a lot of us probably have had similar experiences. One of our panelists asks, do you feel slash have you felt imposter syndrome starting grad school? And how have you worked through that? I wouldn't, so my undergrad was super intense. So I wouldn't say that I felt it academically because I'd already sort of had an experience of having to write an essay every week that like I'd chosen myself, right? And discuss it one-to-one. -one. So I was quite fortunate that I'd had like that kind of academic preparation, but I'd say I definitely felt it like socially and in terms of like knowing what was expected in terms of interacting with peers because it was a different environment to what I'd been in before and I felt that like I was less good at it naturally than other people which is probably my perception of it but that I felt really like nervous about that for a while and I would often feel like socially I had had different experiences and like in my family I had different experiences and they are different they're not better or worse but that definitely made me feel like oh should I be here is it like the right place for me so that's the kind of imposter syndrome that I felt um I would say I it really helped me finding like mentors who had gone through similar things and like speaking to them about it and like making connections and sort of looking at all the things like I had achieved like keeping a list of that and thinking okay that's a really great way of sort of reflecting on like that I am like worthy of being here I guess so yeah Um, I still feel imposter syndrome. <laughs> uh, when I first got here, I was so like, I think we all pr pr probably did like really well undergrad to get into Michigan. So I like I knew academically I was doing decent in school, but it's like a whole other playing field when you're studying like something that no one really knows the answer to. Um, and you constantly feel like you're in the dark, you're lost. So I like, it's just really hard at first, but then like you kind of get used to that. That sounds really bad. Like you kind of get used to like not knowing and like trying to figure out ways to problem solve. Like your degree is basically just different techniques to problem solve. Um, and like the more I got into like my research and I got like posters and talks, I felt like, oh, other people also thought that my work was cool. So I think that like, getting like different accomplishments helped um, and made me realize like, this is all just like practice and time and effort. Um, socially, I don't know if it was like, I felt imposter syndrome like from my peers, like they felt like I was different from them, but I felt like my personal experiences coming to grad school was different that I could never really like bounce back from like certain things as fast as them. Um, I didn't know if there was like an etiquette to talking to professors or like people like what topics I was allowed to talk about what wasn't um, just felt very like lost and confused at the beginning. Um, my family, I like no one went to grad school for my family. So um, a lot of the time I felt like I didn't have that much support from like my family. So because they just didn't know what to tell me. So sometimes I was like, well, no one really understands what I'm going through. So maybe I'm like, not experiencing what everyone else is experiencing. Um, but like the more I talk to people, the more I realize like this is all just a universal feeling of stress and it's fine. <laughs> um, and it's totally okay to be from a different background and like get to where you are today. It's just a reality that you kind of kind of work through. So, so I, I don't think I was necessarily worried about this thing coming in, but I think it's one of the things that's maybe like bothered me the most is that like when I was an undergrad, like I went to a big state school for undergrad and I definitely didn't feel like I was any different from anyone else necessarily. Um, but once I got into like grad school and med school here, like it just becomes so much more apparent that all of your peers' parents are just like so accomplished. Like in my incoming med school class, like one of my parents 
or one of one of this person's parents was he was Dean Rungi's son, who is like the like person who oversees the entire medical school. And that's just like one example. Like half of the class has parents who are PhDs or MDs or has all of this like basically like soft skills that they just like grew up around knowing that like you just don't know about. Um, and I think that's a huge disadvantage, even as, even if you are as smart or as hardworking as these people, you just like don't necessarily know the things that you need to do. Um, and it's really unfortunate, but I mean, it's just one thing that you have to think about and try and mitigate. And I think the best way that I have found to mitigate this is to seek out mentors and role models, even if they are, you know, PIs or just older students, but you need some way to get this advice that these people have grown up with and have access to. Uh, and unless you get that, that advice, that input, that person that's going to look over your application that knows what you're looking for. Like, I think that's, that's just a disadvantage that is intrinsic to being first gen or of a different minority than, than what. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's something that still, I think bothers me a lot and kind of concerns me. Like, it's just, I think the way that it currently is. Thank you. Um, the same student also asks, are there any resources that helped you with applying slash undergoing the process of starting grad school? They feel like it's hard, especially for first-gen students, so specifically as someone who comes from this background, um, what resources maybe helped you in this process? Um, so specifically to Michigan, I would say, Sweetland and the English Language Institute are really helpful because the classes at the English Language Institute, it might sound like they're only for people who don't have English as a first or like main language in their life. But actually, um, there's a lot of classes about academic style and conventions and expectations that anyone can go to. And they're really, really helpful. Like I took a few of them and they were really like great during the dissertation writing stage. And also you can take them as early as coursework, I think, and that can be a really great way of understanding what's expected in an environment where like you're not it's not gonna necessarily affect your GPA or like how people in your department like perceive your work so that's a good place to try stuff out and Sweetland's really great as well because you can go there and learn more about like what's expected for writing they have writing groups where you can connect with other students and build routines that way um but in general for transitioning to graduate school I find the internet quite helpful, like Reddit, Quora and places like that, because you can ask questions anonymously. And obviously, most people on there are not experts, but it's access to a much wider range of peers. And you can, you know, post anonymously and ask things that you might worry about asking, like, you know, publicly or to people, you know. So as long as you kind of verify any information people give you with like offices on campus, if that's appropriate, it can be a really good, like low stakes way of asking stuff and like reading about other people's experiences too. Um, when I was applying for grad school, um, I can actually put links as I talk. Um, there were these mentorship programs that I was looking for. Um, and I found this one that was for like unrepresented minorities, but I think they mostly, they try to target like um, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx uh, groups. Okay, found it. <laughs> uh, it's called Scientifico Latino, which is for like people who are interested in pursuing STEM majors, I mean STEM PhDs. Um, so I had like, I was paired with a peer mentor who was in my field, who was like maybe one to two years um, ahead. And he like helped me with my application. He helped me with like interviews. We did mock interviews together and it was really awesome. I still talk to him to this day um and we check in with each other so like there's some there's so much value to like peer mentors um and there's also schools that offer these types of programs um for my specific field um i know like mit and hopkins offers like this graduates assistance application program um specifically for biomedical engineering um i actually helped start a program for our field, this field too, um, at Michigan, um, and we're entering our second cycle, which is really exciting. Um, but I think mentorship and like finding resources by basically like harassing other students has been super helpful. Um, and just getting used to emailing as many random people as you can for like personal statements or examples or stuff like that. Um, so highly recommend just annoying people. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, w- I would definitely agree. I think find a mentor that's doing what you want to do as early as possible. Um, I think that even if they don't necessarily have the same background as you, they're almost always willing to help you from my experience while being in Chile. Um, so I think that these are the type of people that know exactly what you need to do um, can help you set up like reasonable goals to get there. Uh, so yeah, f- find a mentor the earlier. Yeah, were you worried slash afraid about coming into grad school as a first gen student? And if so, how did you deal with that? Um, I, I don't know if I was like worried or afraid, but I like, I mean, like I knew I was and I sort of knew that I would have to be like proactive in ways that I might not have had to be if I'd had different experiences in my family and like my background. So I think I was just always really conscious of like the networks that I made and the opportunities I got, I really wanted to make the most of because I'd not sort of had necessarily easy access to those things before. And um, I was always thinking that I was like, I had more to learn in terms of yeah interacting with other people and but I I wasn't necessarily worried or nervous about it it was just something that I sort of was going on in the background and sometimes it would like occur to me in class if you know people were having discussions that like weren't necessarily relatable to me about like you know what their parents did or like other people in their family but I just would think to myself well in a way I found it quite freeing because I was like my parents don't really have any unspoken or spoken expectations so I guess I can do what I want so I felt more like every decision I made was I made because I really wanted to do it not because it had always been expected of me implicitly or explicitly or like people around me had sort of told me I was always going to go to graduate school or like everyone had to go to graduate school so I actually came to really appreciate it in that way because it was like I felt like I really owned the decision so yeah um this is a little personal. I think I felt more guilty than worried or afraid because um, I come from like a cultural background where like you always stay as close to family as possible. Uh, people rarely ever like kind of leave um, until I don't know they get a job or something. And like I mentioned, I, no one in my family had ever gone to grad school. Um, so the fact that I was like choosing to move like to a different state uh, for like at least five years away from my family it was kind of like a shock for them and um, I wasn't met with uh, much enthusiasm uh, when I decided to make the decision so um, because I like relied on like their approval or like their support for so long um, I felt very guilty about the decision I was making and very like concerned that it would affect my relationship with them um and also there's like a financial aspect because like when you're first gen there is this socioeconomic link of like you didn't have as much opportunities um as like a high schooler uh to pursue like things and like think about college earlier on or think about like other things um so like i was always like very stressed about finances uh much more than like my peers um at the end of the day it all worked out um there's they they're by now me and my parents uh they still kind of like ask how long do you have and then when I tell them oh I don't know it depends on my advisor they kind of like look at me with a night twitch um, <laughs> um it's like it gets better over time but something that I was just like super scared of is like oh like my parents will never like be happy that I like made this decision that I know is like best for me um but they just don't know and you kind of like have to hold their hand through it, so. I think the thing that I was most worried about is just like whether I was gonna do well or not. And also like, just like the costs that come up for various things. Um, as far as like how you mitigate that, like, I, I don't know, I think it still stresses me out. So, um, I think maybe the best way I do that is I, I try and, you know, clearly write down like what I need to do and set like clear goals and then try and focus on those goals and and not sweat the rest but yeah I don't know oh, I, I think it's something that you know regardless of your background you you worry about whether you're going to do well um, I don't know I don't know if that was super helpful but yeah it stresses me out too thanks y'all uh someone asked or says that they're joining from a PhD in engineering. 
which in undergrad meant relentless, relentless problem sets and some research. And so this person is wondering, how do y'all manage to stay on top of courses while also doing research? So I think it's a, it felt a bit different to me when I was taking courses because I was also teaching during my second year while still taking courses. And I had like my own research project, like humanities research projects. So I didn't have to be in like a specific place at a specific time or anything. So that might make it easier. I'm, I'm not sure. It probably depends on the person. But I'll say that like for balancing a number of different things. So like maybe three or four classes, a research project and maybe teaching, maybe some other kind of job, like hobbies and life. I just like ruthlessly time block everything. So on my calendar, I'm like, okay, so if that class needs X hours of preparation, I'm going to spend those hours and then that's it. And I just move on, which is like, it's a mentality I learned during undergrad because my undergrad was exceptionally busy. And I just sort of had to learn about like good enough as opposed to everything being perfect. So, and like when I was teaching, I would block in the time for preparation that was like in my contracted hours and the time I was in class and the time for office hours and grading. And that was it. I didn't go above the hours and um, with anything really. So my, like my classes for my hobbies, like yoga and circus arts, they were in there as well. So yeah, I would just say allocating time and unless there's an emergency or like a professional reason that you really have to give more time to something than you perhaps would have planned to just sort of but it, and I, I'm not in sciences so I don't know if it's different but I definitely found in the humanities there was a point where it could be done enough to move on to the next thing you had to do so yeah um I don't know if this is um every engineering discipline but from my experience, grad school classes are actually like more chill than undergrad. They It's more discussion based. Um, I try to avoid the classes where they like expected exams or like group projects. Um, but I think it would either be project or discussion based for most um, grad school classes. Um, so it was a lot less of a workload to worry about. Um, I think if you're, you said you're coming from, yeah, they're coming from undergrad. Um, I think it's like interesting how you have to like slowly shift your mindset to not um, care as much about um, courses as research. Uh, something my PI like told me week two is like no one cares about your GPA and your PhD and I was appalled. I like was not convinced and I like tried to get as many A's as I could my first year and then I'm like I remember my second year I like barely like went to class and I still did well. Um, and I'm not saying this to like brag, I'm saying like it's actually not that hard to, to like keep up with assignments because most uh, grad course professors are also PIs and they also care about their students doing research. So it's kind of like classes feel like a formality more than um, like something you have to like do well in. So you'll be fine. Don't worry. <laughs> I think this question kind of gets back to one of the things that I brought up in the intro. Um, in grad school, there are lots of boxes that you have to check and things that you have to do. And I think it's really important to prioritize what matters and what doesn't matter. Grades and classes don't really matter. It's grad school classes as a whole, in my experience, are much easier than undergraduate classes. Um, you should try and learn from them when you can, but I don't think you should at all swim about whether you get a B or an A. I don't think it matters. Um, same thing with your committee, or not your committee, but your prelim. Um, you, you need to pass it. The university wants you to pass it. You should definitely do good work on it, but you should do what you need to do to pass and don't do any more. Things that matter is are prepping for your committee meetings, um, aka like making progress on your research um, and publishing like papers, at least in the sciences. Um, this is why you're here. This is why you're in the PhD program. Like try and devote the majority of your mental energy and your stresses to that instead of other things that maybe feel important at the time, but in the grand scheme of things, don't quite know as much. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. Right, y'all, a conditional pass is still a pass. So as um, someone asked, as a first-gen student, like Donya mentioned, there's an inevitable socioeconomic link. Did you jump right into a PhD or did you complete your master's first? panelists and how did you make that decision um that's one of the choices this person's trying to make for grad school so they wanted to ask since the financial factor is important to consider especially being first gen yeah 
I did a one-year master's in the UK and I applied to PhDs in the US during that and I, I went straight there so I was 23 when I started my PhD. Um, so I think it depends on what you would be doing instead because to me the kind of entry-level jobs I could have got after my bachelor's or after my master's and this is like quite specific to the industry I thought I was interested in which I'm no longer interested in but it actually would have paid me less like after tax and everything else than my PhD did so I'd say like work out what you would possibly be making if you didn't do your PhD and think about what you want to prioritize because when I started my PhD my priorities were very different to now like I wanted like the four months that you get often during a humanities PhD where you can go to different places and do different things while you do your work right and that's maybe different if you have to work in a lab but there were things that were important to me then that like aren't so much now so I think if you know you have responsibilities or you want to get started on like saving a lot for specific things that might be something to consider but it's up to you like pick the pathway that will hopefully lead you to what's important to you. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I went straight from undergrad to a PhD, but in all honesty, I did not make any like cost benefit analysis. I was kind of like, I think I want to do this. So I'm going to do this and I will just, you know, figure it out. Um, I think I still like, I'm happy with my decision, but I wish I had thought more about like co opportunity costs um, and like how much, like just had mentioned, like I'd make when I graduate. Um, I knew that getting an advanced degree would mean like I'd have a higher salary at the end. So you, you kind of have to think like, is working for X amount of years of my PhD going to give me the same experience as getting a PhD and getting landing the job that I want? Um, I knew like what kinds of jobs I wanted and that they required a PhD. So I just like sucked it up <laughs> and I'm just gonna like wait it out till I graduate. Um, but yeah, you're right. It is stressful because you kind of have to I learned how to budget, um, which I never had to do in undergrad, which was kind of a, I guess, a privilege because I was like on a scholarship for most of college. Um, and like our stipend, I think it works. Ann Arbor is expensive to live in, but like it's doable. Um, but yeah, I, I guess like as a grad student, like you don't have the luxury to really save up, to be honest. Um, and that's just like how it is, unfortunately, so. Yeah, I think this is one of those things that's probably super like program dependent and situational dependent. I, I did take a kind of a gap year in between um, uh, my undergrad and actually matriculating here. Um, I think that was because I felt I needed to like get into a program and be qualified. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's kind of situationally dependent. Thanks, y'all. So someone just graduated from a master's program in Taiwan and will be coming to Michigan in less than three weeks. They've been away from their home country for almost three years. Uh, completing their master's has made them feel incredibly stressed, and they don't think that two weeks is enough is enough time to get enough rest. And they think that they need to visit their parents and their siblings. And um, they don't have fears about starting the PhD, but they do feel overwhelmed. Um, and so they feel stressed to start. Um, they're supposed to start lab rotations like immediately as soon as school starts on the 28th of August. Do you have any suggestions for them as they begin this process? Um, are you able to talk to the PIs you're rotating with about possibly starting a little later? Um, I was able to extend my like decision deadline for like when to pick a lab. Mine was like end of October and my, I extended it to uh, almost a month from then um, because I like couldn't make up my mind. I like had started at the right time and everything. So I think they're, you, you should ask them, hopefully they're willing to uh, be accommodating. But if that's something that really matters to you, um, it wouldn't hurt to ask. I agree. I, I found the administration, at least in the programs I've been, to be pretty accommodating and nice. Um, and you never know unless you ask. So I, I would totally try and contact someone, um, maybe multiple people. Hopefully, you know, one one will help you out. 
I would definitely um, echo that. I found the folks at Michigan to be very accommodating and understanding and patient in a way that was not the case in my undergrad. And so if you need something at my undergrad, you couldn't always ask for it. Here, you should at least always ask. And people are almost always willing to work with you. And I think Michigan's really great for that. Um, someone asks panelists that they would like to know how you approach alums or other people for networking and how helpful is it? Um, they will be coming in as an international student and there's a bit of a language barrier. There may be a bit of a language barrier. Oh, okay. So um, I think it can be helpful if you do it strategically. Like I found when I've like, cold called or like approached people that I don't know personally or I haven't been introduced to it's worked really well when like I have a specific reason for contacting the person so um for example I always would send like if I'm looking on LinkedIn or Handshake which is like one of the university's like own things where you can like network with other alumni I always look I always think about what I'm interested in and people who might have something in common with me. So for example, um, when I was interested in starting a career in instructional design at a tech company, I looked for people who also had a humanities PhD who had done the same thing. Then I messaged them really specifically saying, oh, I see you have a humanities PhD and you made that transition. How did you do it? And I think it can help if you're both linked to Michigan, but and you can mention that, that it's not the deciding factor in whether you contact someone. I think focusing on like what you want to get from a conversation and how you think someone can help you, whether that's talking through your application materials, talking about experiences, whether that's them connecting you to other people, giving you a referral for a job application. It can help to be clear about what you want to get from the encounter and then work from there. But I would definitely recommend reaching out to people and, you know, people often people have many things they're balancing so if someone doesn't get back to you it's normally nothing personal or nothing you did wrong and if you're worried about a language barrier you can start by writing to them a few times before you like agree to zoom them or something and then that like when if you feel like you've already built a relationship that can help alleviate nerves in that way um the only um opportunities where i've reached out to alumni um, is from like labs that I've interacted with in Michigan and like I'm I was looking for like an um, internship position for the summer I'm currently doing an internship um, and one of the reasons why I got this internship is like I knew someone who graduated from a lab that I collaborate with who like did an internship like three years ago and they like referred me to this one person to talk to in HR so it's a big loop but like if you like uh, just as mentioned like if you have like a motivation for the conversation uh, and also um, if you kind of know their PI for some reason, they are willing to help you. <laughs> so. I've had really good luck um, meeting people through two formats. One, um, I've had great success just cold emailing people that I've like stumbled upon online. Um, if they have worked at Michigan or at Michigan now, um, I found almost anyone I've asked being willing to meet for 30 minutes to talk about whatever I have in my mind, which is super cool. Um, and the other formats is sometimes there are like these faculty student like mixers or programs, or meals or stuff like that. If you go to those, like it's very easy to start talking to random faculty. And um, even if they can't help you, they might be able to point you in the direction of someone they know who does. Um, so that's also been a pretty successful route for me too. Thanks, y'all. Do you have any particular advice on managing finances? And would you recommend an on-campus job? Uh, so I actually got really interested in personal finance during grad school because I found like I had quite a lot of downtime in the evenings where I'd be looking for things online. So that was something I started reading up on quite a bit. So um, I would say if you Google, there's a lot of really good and quite inspirational like personal finance tips out there. Some are specific to grad students, but my personal advice would be like, at the start of every semester, I always write out what money I'll have available. So like from fellowship, if I'm teaching, from teaching, if I, I when I did an internship, it was that money. And then I sort of work backwards from there. So how much like, like rent would be, how much food would be, like what I need, and then look at what's left over, potentially save some, potentially spend some on things I want. So I'd say being organized about it, if you find you're regularly running out before the end of the month, like tracking what you're spending and if it's things you can sort of change or cut down on, like making those changes where it's practical and 
yeah I would recommend if you're not teaching if your visa conditions allow it if your fellowship if your department allows it definitely getting an on-campus job because it's a good way to go into different spaces on campus to meet new people I did that in my first year before I was teaching and I found it really beneficial so yeah definitely Um, I'm still figuring out how to manage my finances, but um, I think budgeting is really helpful, um, like Justin mentioned. Um, so I, I just echo her opinion. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, budgeting when you're able. Um, I've, I've found if you're just taking care of yourself, the stipend to be pretty manageable living alone um, in Ann Arbor. Uh, I think typically you can find like you know, a studio rent for $1,100 and probably less if you're willing to live in Ypsilanti, which is a great, great option. Um, and if you have roommates, it, it gets even cheaper than that, which is pretty much what I've always done. Um, obviously, everyone's like situation is different, but I think I would recommend against getting uh, a job on the side if you can avoid it, because I feel like uh, your, your, your time here is a trainee. And, you know, anytime you're working is the time that you're taking away from, you know, the, the main point that you're here. But I understand that everyone's situation is different. So. I think that's that's my advice. Thanks. Okay, yeah, we have two more questions from our um, audience. D um, did you all know what you wanted to focus on in your research when starting grad school immediately, or did it change? And is it okay to change as you go through the first few semesters? Yeah, I knew. Like, so I work on. I worked on because I don't do academic stuff anymore, but I worked on French literature and I knew the time period, but it was a big period. It was 300 years. And then as I took classes and like I tried out various things, I even wrote a couple of chapters that I then changed my focus to like a, t a different concept and topic within that period. So I knew roughly the material, but not how I was going to use it. But I know people who have switched totally from like different disciplines, different like within the humanities like different languages different periods different authors everything so it's yeah you can within your first few years especially you can always change tracks which advisors that's usually okay um i just knew like the track i'd be in um in my department were split by like concentrations um and then i just like picked three professors that i really liked that i wanted to rotate in like just because their research seemed cool um, I didn't have like any background in a lot of the things they were talking about. Um, and that's kind of how I picked my lab. I would say keep a really open mind. Uh, I think my interest changed a lot between when I came here and what I'm working on now. Um, I think a lot of that's just based on what you are exposed to. So keep an open mind. Yeah, I've definitely known research to change completely. Um, and so final question, y'all, are there any opinions that you, how do you feel about the healthcare package? Are there any opinions that you have or have heard of uh, from other students about mental health care in Michigan? Um, I found the grad care insurance that you get in PhDs, if like you're on fellowship or you're teaching, I found that it covered what I needed and there were co-pays for mental health care but I mean this was like three years ago for me so it was $25 but that's like the actual price of the sessions was like 200 so it was like the rest of it was fully covered so you should always like check what you might be incurring in terms of cost before you use a service but like people will tell you but I never I never found it like prohibitively expensive, like with the stipend to pay for what I needed. And there's the university health service on campus, which offers a lot of services like annual physicals, vaccines and stuff. And it's right there. And most things are covered by, yeah, the tuition, I think. So, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I feel just the same about our healthcare package. I think it's it's, I think it's pretty good. Um, I did go to the health service as much as I could so I could avoid paying the copay whenever I can. I also, ooh, pro tip, if you could pick your PCP to be someone who works at the health services, then I think you don't have to pay a copay. Um, I did that my first year and it worked, but um, I just wanted like a different doctor. So I switched to that. And that's all like fine. It, I don't think it was too much. Um, in terms of mental health, um, I think it's a mixed bag. Um, I think they're very, unfortunately like so short staff that they can't like offer you as much assistance as they would like so I tried out counseling through CAPS which is like the the counseling services at Michigan 
Um, and I was only able to have like a therapist for a semester. And then they, she had, it was like a short term thing. And then she had to like either refer me to someone um, or like kind of tell me to figure it out on my own. Um, and luckily I was referred to some people um, and things ended up working out. Um, but you could also consider like group therapy if you want um, through CAPS. Like they try their best to provide as many resources as they can. And I think um, I've had a positive experience, but um, you might want more, you might want like less um, exposure to therapy. That's something that you could maybe talk to someone from CAPS or um, um, a different therapist from like an external, uh, like a third party through our healthcare. I think in my experience with the uh, the healthcare that's provided through the grant programs has pretty been pretty generous and pretty pretty good. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks, y'all. I have a final question for you. Um, I'd love to hear the biggest piece of of advice that you would have to give to our audience as they start their new journey. Yeah, I think being open to like your academic and professional goals changing and making the most of all the opportunities you can even if you don't necessarily think it's a perfect fit for you because you know there's no perfect fit there's like perfect for you at the time but yeah so I need to think for a second so I'm gonna pass it <laughs> I think my biggest piece of advice would be to find a mentor that you think you will work well with Um, I think I, I'm going to second the mentor because I think that really makes or breaks um, your PhD, in my opinion, uh, but also like having a good support system. Um, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, panelists, for your time and your expertise and sharing all of that with us today. And thank you, audience members, for being here. Um, the recording of this event will be sent to you once it's been processed. I'd like to share that there is a First gen listserv that you can um, become a part of and get um, information information every once in a while about being first gen at Rackham and some resources that might be helpful. Um, our panelists' email addresses will be put in the link so that you can contact them if you have any further additional questions. And please don't forget to fill out the survey so that we can better improve our services for you. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you. Take care of yourselves.